Well, welcome everyone. Good evening and welcome to the last part of our voter education webinar series. This event is brought to you by the South Shore, South Shore chapter of uh, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. My name is Courtney Henderson. I serve as the vice president and social action chair for the chapter. Um, I wanna thank you all for sharing your evening with us. And I wanna thank you for your continued support uh, with our endeavors. Before I hand the virtual floor over to our moderator, I wanna make a few announcements. Um, we will have some time at the end of this event to allow attendees to ask questions. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat box and I will be monitoring them. And towards the end of our evening, I will read them and will allow the panelists to answer. Um, this event is being recorded and we will have it uploaded to our sorority chapter website and we'll have it broadcasted with the Brockton community access for future viewing. Now I will introduce my dear friend, the moderator for this evening, Tony Branch. Let me get your bio here. I think I've read this a thousand oh, no. times now. <laughs> Tony is a lifelong community activist and is presently a commissioner and chair of the Commission on Div Diversity for Brockton. He serves on the board of Haitian Community Partners, Cape Verde and Association of Brockton, the Massachusetts Alliance Against Predatory Lending, and is first vice president of the Brockton area NAACP. Tony is elected to the Southeastern Regional Vocational School Committee, a district that encompasses nine communities representing Brockton, Stoughton, Easton, Foxborough, Shannon, Sharon, East Bridgewater, Mansfield, Norton, and West Bridgewater. He serves as vice chair of the committee and chair of both the personnel and policy subcommittees. Tony is the only African-American elected to a regional school committee in the Commonwealth. Tony is the co-host of Stand Up Strong, WVBF, 1530 AM and 99.7 FM and television host of the NAACP TV Forum, broadcasted on Brockton Community Access, Xfinity Channel 9. Governor Charlie Baker appointed Tony as a Justice of the Peace in January of 2019. Tony is a retired pastor and Pentecostal bishop, currently serving as the National Ap uh, Apostolic Leader of Revival Nation Chap Chapels of America Incorporated, a church planting and pastoral training organization. Tony's seminary education is from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and he resides in Brockton, Massachusetts, the champion city. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. I love reading it every time. <laughs> <laughs> so I will hand over the virtual mic to Tony to introduce the panelists, and then we'll dig in. Well, I want to first thank you, Vice President uh, Courtney Henderson, as well as the South Shore Alumni Chapter for the great work that you're doing around this voter education series. I have tonight two distinguished panelists um, that I'm going to introduce fully through their bios. We wanna first start with Rita Mendez. Rita Mendez has a thriving law practice and real estate agency. Rita uh, is the leading Brazilian American attorney on the South Shore. Fluent in Portuguese and Spanish, she has led the way for many new citizens to become homeowners. As a trilingual attorney focusing on civil and criminal litigation, she's fast becoming a person who many in the immigration, criminal, divorce, and custody issues in the city of Brockton rely on. Rita Mendez received her Juris Doctor degree from the New England School of Law of Boston. She has an undergraduate degree from UMass Dartmouth and an associate degree from Massasoit. Rita is one of our own. She's a graduate of Brockton High School. Aside from being an attorney and a real estate broker, Rita Mendez is a mother, homeowner, and a wife. She volunteers her time uh, in the community as a, an attorney at the New England Community Center. In 2019, Rita Mendez ran for Boston City Council at large. She was sworn into office in January of 2020, the first Brazilian American to hold office in the city of Brockton. Rita Mendez was born in Brazil. She became a United States. She came to the United States when she was 12 years old without speaking any English. She is an American success story and a shining example of hard work, diligence, that accomplishes much. Also with me tonight, we, we know well, <laughs> Tina Cardosa. Tina Cardosa is, is in her second year, is in her second year of the first term as a Brockton City Councilor 
at large in Brockton. She's a registered nurse of 23 years, graduate of UMass Boston School of Nursing. The bulk of her, her career has been at the Boston Medical Center and, excuse me, at the Boston Medical Center and a staff nurse in a community center. She's a proud founder of a nonprofit organization called Caverdian Women United, which provides culturally appropriate violence prevention and education, mental health awareness and resources. She also works within that group to empower women in Brockton. She has three grown children, all girls who are on their own. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she lives with a, a Rita, did you, I mean, excuse me, Tina, did you really write this? She lives with her in Brockton with her boyfriend and her puppy. We love you. You're so down to earth. She engages in, commu she engages in community engagement and activism in the hopes of empowering women of color to run for office. Two of the strongest panelists that I've had in a very long time. God bless you. I'm going to give you guys a hand clap. So to this series, lots going on across the United States of America. Our focus today is I voted now. Uh, what, 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 what happens after holding elected office? How do we hold those that are in elected office accountable? Now, this is interesting because both of you all are in elected office here in the city of Brockton, but you, it wasn't easy to come by your office. Let us begin by addressing the elephant in the room. On January 6, 2021, uh, there was an, in, an insurrection at the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Now, I, I'm going to you know, when I talk to people, I say, I'm just like talking to you in my living room. So I'm gonna ask you this question. In terms of accountability, there's been a unique system of accountability in the United States of America. And I'm gonna put it to you, one white and one black. Um, when you look at how whites, especially those that are part of the MAGA uh, movement, they're a little bit more touchy feeling. Okay, I, I'm being nice, they're a little bit violent. When you look at what occurred at the nation's capital and you contrast that with what occurred um, in Brockton, Massachusetts, when Black Lives Matter was marching, you can distinctively see the difference. Um, I'm gonna ask you, take, take a look at this for a moment. We want to thank the Telegram for that, and we want to thank our, our Zoom director, Courtney, for that. So let me ask you the question. Which way should we be going in terms of making sure we're holding elected officials accountable? The MAGA way or Black Lives Matter? What say you? Rita, Tina? Hi, hey, Tony. I just want to thank Courtney and the chapter for inviting me. This is an honor and a privilege privilege to be here with my colleague and with um, the bishop. And I want to thank all of the uh, attendees for, for joining us tonight. Sorry, I lost your face, Bishop. I'm trying to like, no <laughs> what happened to his face? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's disturbing what we just witnessed. Um, it's to me, it's fair. It's fair. Um, I think people, white people, are afraid of blacks um, and afraid of how they show up. And I think it's misunderstanding. I think it's a lack of, of uh, empathy. Um, there's just so much that we can say about it. And I think we're in a, in a, we're still kind of in a dark place even though we have a new president because there's a lot of work to be done. 
Um, and I'm, ho I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful with this new administration that we start to tackle some of the systemic racism and the racial inequality and all the, in looking at our history, understanding the history so that we can find a way to move into the future. I was very encouraged today with President Biden's um, signing of the um, different, uh, how do you call it? Uh, I mean, he's signing a lot of executive orders, but go ahead. Executive orders, um, because at least that gives us some hope that our new leader is going to lead us in that direction. So, Tina, I'm gonna cut you I off. don't condone any types of violence. Sorry, uh, Bishop. No, no, I'm going to cut you off. The question is, so well, I voted now holding elected officials accountable. I, I need to be really specific on this. Am I to climb up on the walls of the nation's capital, climb through windows, smash police officers? I, I So I want us to get to... How are we going to hold our, I have MAGA telling us the way we're going to hold them accountable, our method is what they did at the nation's capital. What say you? Right. But you have to look at all of this and see how we got to where we are today, I feel. I don't um, condone any acts of violence, but I think that we are in this space because of our past and because of, you know, what this previous administration, the 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 rhetoric, the you know, just the lack of leadership. Um, so we're we're in this space now. What do we do? Um, I just don't know. I really don't know. Like, where do we go from here? Uh, you don't want anyone breaking down your stores in the black and brown communities and causing destruction. You don't but, want but that because. Done, but it's been done. It's been done, but it affects us because yeah. the, the mom and pop stores is what we rely on to pay our bills. So we don't want people breaking them down. We don't want anyone going to our White House and threatening, threatening, you know, the senators there and, you know, doing this craziness that we saw last week. We don't want that type of violence, but I think it takes leadership. How do we hold people accountable? We vote. <laughs> That's how you, you know, you got to get out. You got to vote. You got to remove people from office that are not you know, doing what they need to do to meet your your needs. Um, and I think that that's the work that we should be focusing on is how do we get rid of people that are not doing what they need to do to, to meet the needs of the communities so that we're not in this space. Councilor Mendez, you saw that video. Uh, individuals, I mean, uh, uh, it was a stark contrast between what the law enforcement's relationship with BLM, with Black Lives Matter, how they were able to put up gates, uh, uh, block their access. There was a free for all at the nation's capital. And so let me be clear to the audience. This is not, this is really not politics we're talking about. We're talking about two distinct groups and how they want to hold our government accountable. What say you, Rita, when you look at that video and you see the contrast? Yeah, that was the first time I actually saw the vi video comparing uh, in contrast. And so I was, it really brought tears to my eyes just to see that, you know, the Black Lives Movement, they were just really fighting for social justice, fighting for equality, but doing it in a peaceful manner. And then when there's some riots, some people that get involved in that group, they're not really part of the group that makes a huge mess, then we completely forget the message that they're actually bringing forth. And we only focus on that small specific group of people, nothing to the extent that we saw happening on that January 6th. And every time when I see that video of what's happening to the nation and how we're being seen uh, globally to other leaders in other countries and how they're talking about America and American democracy and how this is just really never happened. It just, it still brings tears to my eyes because it, it's just so sad that we've come to this point and we've, we've gotten here and we've just been listening and allowing the previous administration to do whatever he felt was he was entitled to do because he held that office and he sat in that seat and he made his truth become a reality to those people. So it's just so sad to see how blinded they are and how they think they're doing what it's right, how they believe they're also holding their elected officials accountable mm -hmm. by doing s such that magnitude that they can't really see how 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 absurd that is and, and how so I, I just they've just been brainwashed I, I really can't get my head around it I, I just it's just sad how we've gotten this far it's just absurd so so let me let me so let me be very careful because you know I, I do a lot of these 
And I'm going to tell you, when I talk to young people in the city of Brockton to Roxbury, Massachusetts, uh, when I've talked to uh, uh, young people, young adults in New York City, uh, there is a consistent theme that our generation is weak, uh, that we may not have liked what Magna is doing, but that is the response that is required because of the oppressive form of politics in this country. What's, what are you saying to those young adults that say, hey, listen, we might need to throw a brick or two. That might be the requirement. What do you say to them that say that we're weak? You, Tina, you are muted. Sorry about that. Um, to Rita's point, I think that we can see it on both sides. I think that the Magna folks will look at the Black Lives Matter and say the same thing, that they're being destructive and that they're, you know, um, they're angry and they're channeling their, um, you know, their, their, their protests are not being channeled appropriately. You know, so I don't think there's a clear answer, uh, Tony, as to how do we hold folks accountable? Is this the right way? Because some sometimes people get so emotional and so frustrated that they're not being heard, that sometimes that's the only way that they feel they can be heard. Um, so even though we don't condone it, they we can't decide for folks what their experiences are. You know what I mean? If that's what they feel, um, then sometimes that's the only th way that they know how to express it. I think there's something deeper that needs to be done to avoid that. You know, there are deeper conversations again around empathy and understanding and looking back at history and white privilege and systemic rate, all of those things that we can kind of look at. So then we can decide how do we educate people, young people on how to, cha to channel their frustrations in a more positive way manner do you know what i mean so i think it's a tough question yeah and you do that all the time you ask these tough questions <laughs> but um yeah i don't know if holding your elected officials accountable means violence but i also don't want to speak for people who have been oppressed and they're feeling like that that's the only way they know how to express themselves so all right well, well let's talk a little bit about the city of brockton recently the preliminary numbers of the uh, census report indicates that Brockton is a predominantly, and people uh, don't like to hear this, but Brockton is a predominantly black city. Uh, with that said, similarly in Ferguson, Missouri, in 2014, the mayor, five members of the city council and the chief of police were all right in 2014 uh, of Ferguson, Missouri. But let's also understand that they had some clearly some racial issue, but the city had been predominantly black for decades. Today, half of Ferguson's police officers are black, including the chief of police, four of the city council members are black, and the incoming, the, the mayor at that point uh, is black. Does voting matter? Voting in terms of, and I'm asking this specifically, because we always shake our heads, yes, it matters. Wait a minute, does it really matter? Because when you, at times for the last four or five decades, when you've had predominantly black mayors, predominantly black city councils, we still run into uh, 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 deficits in terms of political power. Does voting matter? Voting, and I, I don't know if I can, I hope they, the, the sorority doesn't get mad, but I gotta ask this question. Does voting black matter? Let's, 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 let's bring it up. <laughs> Rita, you wanna go? <laughs> Rita, you understand? I mean, people say you, you, you know, vote, vote, vote the characteristics of who you are, your politics, and the lens in which you bring. Does that really matter? Brockton's an example. I got, I have more to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure you do. So, um, just going back to Tina's point real quickly, I have to disagree. I really don't think that we should be encouraging, and I don't think you're encouraging uh, violence in any manner. But every time when we see uh, that people protest and, and they get into violence, I think that at that point, they sort of lose their entitlement to be to be protesting. So I think we can get a lot accomplished in peace, but I will just uh, put that aside. But speaking into voting and voting who you see that will best represent you, yes, it makes sense that 
Uh, those who are holding office, they'll look like you, they'll speak your language, they'll understand where you came from and what your trials and difficulties in life and why, and even understanding the cultural aspect of it. I think it's very, very important because then when you're speaking, when you're voting, when you're doing everything holding that while holding that seat, you'll bring all of that with you. And that will most likely impact those people's lives because the problem with the, the black communities and also the um, immigrant communities is that they really don't speak up as much. They are not the ones calling us and asking us that they want to stop this project because they don't want it to come into their neighborhoods. A lot of times they don't even find out about it until it's already passed and voted on because they're so busy working two, three different jobs. They're single parents. You know, they, they have to take care of their children. So they have their own personal lives that they have to also take care of. And it's very difficult for them. So they are holding all of that on their own. So the least they expect is that when we are in that position, that we're taking those votes and we're taking the, their matters seriously, even though they may not even be paying attention, but they, they are hoping that they're trusting that we are doing that for them. It's better if they engage, it's better if they reach out to us, it's better if they voice their opinions. But unfortunately, they're the ones that most of the times they they don't necessarily uh, as as involved as they should. Okay, so, okay, so Rita, let's just, so because you guys are, are going that, that way, so I'm gonna pull this out of you. The clearest example of pushback is the vote yesterday, is the vote yesterday with respect to this $98 million public safety complex. Uh, I've heard from at least 23 people that the importance of the fire union and the police union supersedes the will of the people of the city of Brockton to even have a conversation, to even have a conversation so when you look at activism and you look at um, you know, the, the fact that you want the voice of people to be heard, how is it possible that the voice of the people are not being heard on our own council? Is, can I ask that question? Tina, go for I'll it. Go, I'll go there. So the first question you asked were, does voting matter? Yes. And absolutely it matters. We saw what happened in Georgia so we we have to believe that it does matter and you know the hard work that Stacey Abrams and other folks did to turn that state blue made a huge difference in our balance of power and that's going to really matter right so we have to you know highlight those stories so people understand the importance of their vote and then the other thing that we highlight, we see the pandemic and, and how much destruction the pandemic has caused and how we manage the pandemic, even at the local level. Um, and that really showed like a lot of the racial inequities and the health disparities that exist in the community. So had we, you know, if we have people that represent us on the council and in, you know, the administration and in posi positions of leadership, that definitely helps our community because there will be more advocacy around funding, around um, different resources that we need to combat um, the pandemic and to address those inequities, right? So representation matters, voting definitely matters. If we didn't learn that from this last election, and from the pandemic, then I don't know when we're gonna learn that. Now, the next part to your question, you can remind me because I'm old, was in reference to the 98 million that we voted on yesterday, correct? And um, you, I mean, you met- We're talking ahead. about accountability and, and, and activism, people being heard. How were the people heard yesterday in our own backyard? They were not heard. And that's the problem. When we have um, residents, and I'm gonna say this, white residents that protest the development. So my constituents, my black constituents call me for a whole gamut of reasons, okay? For things that I probably <laughs> can't even help them with, but I do my best, right? Because they're suffering and they're, they're, they're thirsty, they're hungry for someone that they can reach out to that speaks their language, that looks like them, that's been where they are, that's shared ex those similar experiences to, to, to talk to, that can, can point them in the right direction. And so I get a whole slew of constituent concerns from domestic violence to my kid is acting up, what do I do with them? Um, I can't pay my rent, I can't pay my mortgage, I need food, you know, I'm being mistreated at the police station, blah, 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 everything. 
my white constituents will only call me if there's a development going up in their neck of the woods, right? That's the only concern I get from my white constituents in Brockton. And I'm not saying that that's not good because I wanna be able to represent them as well. I represent all the people. I was voted to, to represent the people and it's impacting their quality of life. So I always say to people, I'm only one vote, but to my white constituents, I'll say, listen, this is really important to you. And remember how hard you're fighting to get this done for your neighborhood. But when you hear black constituents complaining about something that's important to them, I would like for you to kind of, you know, empathize with them and, and, and help support their cause because their cause is just as important as yours. And I think that that's what played out last night. I think that the council did not hear the people. They did, you had 40, 50 people write to us um, concerned about the public safety complex and spending all this money. It wasn't necessarily that they are against police. That wasn't the language in the emails that we received. The language was around transparency, accountability. We're, we're able to borrow $100 million. So why don't we prioritize things that are important to me? I need to eat. My kid needs a nice school to go to. They need programs to go to after school. You know, I, I, I'm having a hard time with my partner. He's hitting me. He's beating me. These are priorities in the Black community, okay? They're not, their priority is not that we have a pretty public safety building. They, they have deeper priorities than that. And that's what my council, my fellow council men and women are not seeing. And it's very frustrating. It's painful. I didn't sleep last night because of how, how bad I felt over that vote. So representation matters, Bishop, just to answer your question. And, you know, having people that understand your pain and your struggle definitely matters. Voting does matter. We've seen it because we would have had another four years of Trump if people didn't work hard um, to, to change this, uh, you know, this election. So yes, to Rita? your point. Rita? Yes, uh, no, I agree. I agree with Tina. Um, and last night was a difficult night because at first the motion was just to continue it. And the continuance was just going to be for a couple more weeks. It wasn't even going to be uh, a very long period of time. So it wasn't really going to make a whole lot of difference within that two weeks in order to postpone that vote last night. But yet that failed. And then once it failed, all the complaints that I heard from the people that were sending the emails were none of them that they were actually against the public safety building. It's just that they wanted to be heard. They wanted to understand exactly what we were doing with that money and wanted to be heard. So at that point, we're left in a position whether to vote in favor or against this project that, that it Brockton does need it. And it's not like ever, people were saying anything that they didn't want it or they didn't need it. But then at that point, I, I felt like I had it to vote in favor, even though I wasn't comfortable with my vote because I felt that people did have the right to, to voice their opinions and we didn't do that beforehand. So, so that is where we left, we're left with the conflict when we're holding that seat. What is the best thing to do for the people to best represent the people, even though things doesn't go as we plan and or as we wish? So in, so in light of what occurred yesterday, in light of what's happening nationally, how do we, how do our verse, voice, what is the best way for the voices of the people to be heard locally on local issues, on national issues? And I'm gonna add this caveat, public safety complex, George Floyd, George Floyd, then a public safety complex, people wanna be heard, just thinking about that, I'm going to add to my question, how do you convince, when, when we talk about our voices being heard, how do your voices be heard, are going to be heard on that council, speaking to them in the lens of the experience of people of color? Uh, yeah. I'll go first. Bishop, it's hard. They're not going to hear us until they address their own biases and they address their own, you know, the history and they address, you know, the way things have played out on a council for many, many centuries, <laughs> for many years. Um, and there's just so much that they need to address on their own before they can hear us. If you don't, if you don't work on yourself 
and you don't identify that there's an issue, how are you going to hear people? I'm not the most articulate person. Okay. I show up the way that I show up and I speak the way that I speak. Uh, and um, that might be a challenge. Maybe they're not hearing me because I'm not speaking their language, but um, I'm saying what I feel. Yeah. And um, because I've had to do some work on myself. I grew up Cape Verdean and you know, the challenges of growing up Cape Verdean. We grew in the same place where African-Americans and Cape Verdeans did not get along. And so it's, it was a different experience being an immigrant than being a, an African-American, right? So I've had to do a lot of learning. I've had to check myself when I was being biased and I've had to do a lot of growing. So if I can do it, I challenge my colleagues to do it because we're not gonna get anywhere if they can't see where I'm coming from. So, but I mean, and Rita, please weigh in on this. I, again, I'm just gonna go back to this. Everyone saw, a majority of all Americans saw the George Floyd murder. Why was that enough to change hearts? Rita, how do you convince your colleagues? How do you have this conversation of accountability? We're talking about, I mean, this is, this webinar is about the general, you know, the general public after voting, holding elected officials accountable. But I'm sitting here with two powerful women of color. How are you going to hold folks accountable that you're working with? Yes. I got to ask that. No, and that, that is a, a very valid question. And um, the, the reality is that we, we can never give up. We, we may feel like we're losing the fight but we still in the battle, like we haven't lost it. Those are small steps. And that's what it takes maybe to, for bigger changes, maybe more, unfortunately, George Floyd's, that wasn't the first time that ever happened in the United States. That happened for centuries, for years, but that was the time that it shook America because we had it on camera. So that's what we need to keep on doing. We see that stuff happening in our own backyards. We need to make sure we have it on camera. We make, make sure that we display that because that's going to that's what's going to take for people to wake up because once they see it on national tv they're like that doesn't happen in brock that would never happen in here we treat people with respect we don't treat you know our black communities like that but once we're living in our skins as blacks we know how we're being treated we know how we're feeling exactly the reality that maybe others don't don't feel it don't see it don't go experience in their daily lives so unfortunately the more it happens the more it brings to light the more we have these things on camera and these reports these testimonies these witnesses and people speaking up telling their story telling what's happening it's going to be enough to really wake us up and to say enough is enough and we have to come to a point where we say enough is enough. It's not going to be an easy battle, but we have to keep on fighting. We may think we're losing, but we keep on going. We can't just give up and say it's hopeless. There's nothing we can do about it because then, 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 then we're done. But as long as we're fighting, I think there's hope. Can I just say something really quick, Tony? So sure. just every time my brothers and sisters, people of color speak up in Brockton or they write and an, they send an email to the councils or the mayor, I am so proud. I don't consider them troublemakers. To me, they're not outside agitators. To me, they're not bullying me to, to vote a certain way. To me, they are involved and engaged and it's refreshing. It's something that we have fought so long to get people of color to be more engaged civically. And now that it's happening, we're getting the pushback. You know, these are troublemakers. We're not gonna be bullied. Um, you know, they're, they're going about this the wrong way and they need to, we can't dictate. And this is to my point with Councilor Mendes, what I was trying to say. You can't dictate how people react when they have been frustrated and oppressed and they've been through so much trauma in their lives. What we can do is try to address that trauma and show them a better way and show them that we are with them and not against them. Because the more you push back on this, the more you cause that friction. And that's where violence ensues. You know what I mean? Um, so I'm really proud of people that speak up. I love community forums. I love to have community input on different projects in the city. I think it's healthy. I said it last night. 
that the, your only a, a city is only as healthy as the engagement of its residents and you know that transparency and so you know to me it, it's healthy and I encourage people to keep doing it. So how do you, so when you, when you say you encourage people to, how do people that have voter apathy, so again, the city of Brockton being majority black, um, right now, as you know, in Boston, if uh, Marty Walsh goes on confirmation here in Secretary of Labor, they will have an acting mayor who will be African-American, most likely the next mayor of Boston will be a, a woman of color. Uh, there's less voter apathy in Boston than there is in Brockton. I, I can tell you that for a fact. How do you get people involved that have that apathy in Brockton saying that it's never changed, Bishop, I'm not gonna vote. It's, I see Tina up there, I see Reed, I hear Moses, but nothing ever changes. What are your suggestions in terms of getting those people engaged in the political pro process? I'll let you go, Rita. That goes back to what I was saying before, sort of giving up, giving up your hope. And I think that once we stop hoping, then then we stop seeing the change. So the more people get involved, we can't really force people to get involved. But I think that the more they do, then the, the they'll begin seeing the small steps of progress of happening. And then that will bring back hope to people. Because if you're just expecting that it's going to change overnight, nothing ever changes overnight. The biggest revolutions that happen in America, it takes those uh, few selected people fighting for that, uh, for what they believe in order to see that come to fruition. Maybe it's not going to be uh, in our generation, maybe it's going to be in our children's generation, but then we're paving the road, we're paving the way for them to make sure that once, you know, they are our ages and they hold political office, that they will see a different time. They will see that we're, we're sometimes we're just sowing for our future generations. And if we're just, we'll all think like that, you know, we're giving up and, and nothing ever going to change and it's all going to be the same, then then you might as well, you're giving up on your city, giving up on your future, your kids' future. So I, I don't think that is the message. And unfortunately, I know that that is how people feel. Right, because, yeah. and, they, and they feel that way. Can, I'm gonna go outside of Brockton. They feel that way in the combo. Where, where's our Stacey Abrams? Where is our, our Clyde Claiborne? <laughs> I mean, that's Clyde, right. Clyde C Claiborne made Joe Biden president. And yep. people don't, I know people don't wanna hear that, but that's the truth. A single man gave him South Carolina, which yeah. which bounced his presidency back in the national scene. Yeah. Where's well, our, well where's that goes Stacey? that goes back to leadership, Tony. And that's what that's what being a good leader. I said this last night. My seat is not mine. My seat belongs mm -hmm. to the people. And and I will do as long as I'm there, I will do what I can to represent the people. And it they're 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 looking for leadership. They're looking for guidance. And that's the only way they're going to stay engaged and stay involved. And then we have to celebrate those small wins. That's that's very important. So when we do win, when we do have those little, it can be tiny, we celebrate them and we show people, hey, this is what voting for, you know, this candidate um, has done for you. You know, this is what this candidate is doing for you right now. Don't you think now that your voting matters? You know, you have someone up there that's representing you, that knows you, that's working hard every day um, to, to do what they can for you. I think we have to celebrate those small wins. We have to keep people engaged and we got to meet them where they are. And we got to show them that this is possible. We can't, it, it, it's exhausting honestly, um, but we can't give up. Like Rita says, we have to continue to, 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 you know, keep them engaged, keep them involved, just like what we're doing today with on this discussion. Rita? Also, what I wanted to add, like we don't have to do it alone. We can uh, get involved in uh, the same groups of people that are uh, like-minded. So that way there's powers in numbers. Uh, an example is I uh, worked very hard in the Biden campaign because I really wanted to see him get elected. And, and my issue that I see of um, the people every day, it's immigration because this is what I deal with. I know 
that in the United States, we, we definitely uh, need to see some immigration reform happening. So I'm also part of the ALA uh, members, which is like American um, immigration attorneys. And what we did now that Biden got elected, we got together and wrote a letter of suggestion what we're hoping to see happening in immigration. So I don't have to do it alone. I worked to make sure he got elected. Now he's there. We're going to hold his administration accountable. But it's not just going to be Rita just by herself trying to go directly to the president and try to say, oh, you do X, Y, and Z because this power is in numbers. So I'm a member of this organization that it's uh, inside the whole United States, we all get together and then we're all the immigration attorneys here, uh, here in the United States and we can go up to the White House and we say, this is what we expect to see. This is what we hope to see. This is what we would like to see accomplished. And that's a way to uh, get involved also as well, not by doing alone, but also, you know, NAACP is a perfect example of that. Getting involved, joining those different organizations that are like-minded, that are really going to be advocating for what you believe in. I think that is um, priceless. So let me just ask you something. One of the one. Tony, sorry to interrupt you. I see a few hands. I just want to oh, make another. Those who um, may have missed the announcement. If you have a question, please um, put it in the question and answer box, and we'll uh, we'll address it at the end of uh, our event. So um, I do see the hands. I do want to acknowledge that I see them, um, but we're we're going to take questions towards the end. Sorry, Tony. No, no, do I have time to ask more questions? <laughs> Absolutely, you okay, do. I'm sorry about. So I want I wanted to to address something that may be mm, a little touchy, but I have to ask because I know people have wondered this and there's actually a little bit nervous about speaking up. So I'm gonna, so Rita, you, you, you mentioned support of the Biden campaign, Biden, a Democrat. Um, there seems to be a distinct difference in the national democratic banner than what happens on the local level. This is gonna be uncomfortable, but I, I'm gonna say this to you. President Trump, oh, people are gonna get angry. President Trump was not necessarily wrong when he said Democrats have controlled local politics for decades and what do blacks have to lose? So in saying that, okay, support Biden on a national level, but how is difference gonna be made with political parties on the local level who seem to be really disconnected from their constituency. Rita, Tina? Anybody? I'll go, I'll touch that all day long because I've been saying it forever. I, I have no qualms, like I, I'm not afraid to say it. The local level Democratic Party is out of touch and they, um, they do not um, understand the the values and the principle of the the, the Democratic uh, Party at all to me, um, as a woman and a woman of color that was in a situation where I really needed the support of other women that understands, um, you know, the value of women in general. I'm not even gonna say black women, women in general. Right. I had so many women from the Democratic City Committee that were against me uh, when I had an altercation with a. Um, elected official in the city. I was very disappointed in um, my fellow Democrats. And that's happened time and time again, where they haven't, they don't stand true to their, their values and their principles when it comes to local politics and people in the community. Yes, they, they'll go out there and, you know, uh, fight for Biden to get into office, fight against Trump's rhetoric, but here I am <laughs> right in your neck of the woods and I'm going through something and you don't support me as a woman. You don't support people of color. You know, you don't, you, our struggles are not your struggles. So you don't care. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of work to be done on the local level. And that's why I've distanced myself and I'm gonna say this and people are gonna be upset, but it's where we're at from the, the, the democratic city committee because I, I feel like they're not fighting for the principles. They're not fighting for the policies. Look at what Biden did today. Very first thing he did today was to, um, you know, the, I turned on the TV headlines, 
Biden is signing these executive orders around racism and racial inequality yeah, and the yeah. prisons, the private prisons and all of this stuff. And I'm like, shit, am I in the right place? Excuse my French. I, am I, I was like, wait a minute, let me turn this back on. Is that our president? You know, that's what I want to see in Brockton. That's what I want to see in Brockton. I want people to wake up and to understand we're a majority black city and we have issues and we need your help. You, you're, you need to stand with us on these issues and that's not happening. And then we get threats that the fire and the police unions are gonna be against us if we vote against this uh, public safety complex. Well, damn them to me, because you know if you don't stand with us, if you, you're either with us or you're against us. I'm not afraid of threats from the fire and the police uh, unions. You know, they should be ashamed of themselves. They should be standing right along with us saying, yes, we're going to get this money, but we're also going to prioritize youth. We're going to prioritize mental health. We're going to work with the community so people are not afraid of police anymore. They, so they understand that we are with you. It, it, they, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Bishop. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you for being honest as you always are, Tina. Rita. Yes. What do we do? Yes, so I agree uh, with Tina partially uh, to the fact that uh, of her concerns regarding the Democratic City Committee. But then I take a different approach. I wanted to be very engaged because I wanted to see that representing our values. So I don't think you should distance yourself, Tina. I would love to have you back because I don't miss a meeting because I they need more Tinas, more readers, more Tony Branch, more people like us and their voice and our opinions getting engaged and changing. We also, we're talking about holding elected officials accountable. We well, also yeah. need to hold elected officers accountable. Every time when it is coming to voting, it's always the same people that just gets reelected for as long as they wish or unless they don't want to uh, continue that position because there's not really anybody else in there that wants to get elected, that wants to hold those positions. So we're just letting the same people over and over again. And then we expect a different result. It's never going to happen, but I'm not going to give up on the party. I want to make sure I get involved, that I make my opinions and my voices heard. And then I encourage you to come back, get involved, and we're changing it. I beg to differ. I disagree with my colleague. I have I have too much work to do in my own community than trying to educate white folks on these issues. They can pick up a book and read. They can get involved. They can come to us. We don't need to go to them. They can come to us and say, how can I help you? That's what needs to happen. You know, we have been doing this for a long time, Rita, with all due respect, teaching white people how to treat us. I'm over it. I do what I can on our council. If they feel like they truly represent the Democratic Party and their values, they can come to us. So let me ask you, is there room for Black conservatism in, in this conversation? So I, I have to ask, so is there room for Black conservatism, especially around, I mean, there's Black conservatives have been beat, beaten up beaten up they really have been beaten up by the so-called liberal progressive uh, and quite frankly when i talk to black people in the barbershop when i go get my hair retwisted uh, uh yeah, i'm sorry should i i apologize for saying that large <laughs> but you know what i mean when i go get my hair retwisted uh and i hear people talking they said they, they don't want to hear progressive or, or liberal they're talking about they want a job they want to go to college without a lot of debt um, they don't want to be criticized for their religion, for their faith. Um, they want privacy. So I, I guess my, my question is, outside of the Democratic, it seems like Black people locally are confined to the Democratic Party. I'm a Democrat, so so if anybody say, what is he talking about? I'm a Democrat, but, my, but I have some very conservative views. I like That's my fire awesome on, question. don't you? Don't you want? Don't That's you want? an awesome question. I love oh. that question. Oh. <laughs> I mean, don't, I, I mean, had to chime in on that one. <laughs> oh, they, they want their firearms, uh, you know. So my question: are, are are the Democrats out of touch with with blacks that are Democrats but are conservative? Can can I ask that question? Does anybody want to touch that? Is there a room? Is there room for non-progressive policies? Can I ask that? Come on, Tina, Rita. Are you asking specifically to Brockton or in general? Um, Let's talk in general. We don't have to do not, not Brockton. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, uh, like what you said, people are 
mostly concerned about those things, you know, their jobs, being able to pay their mortgages, lower property taxes, um, more um, educational opportunities for their kids, college tuition, lower college tuition, um, all of that. If I, if, if we were to talk Brockton, I would say yes. You know why? Because we have some, you know, it, our largest community of people are Cape Verdeans in Brockton for the most part, right? Would you well, agree? Well, statistics, so let me just clean that up because I hear a lot of people saying that people don't realize that. So Cape Verdean Americans that identify are really only 30, 33% of Brockton. Then first, first and foremost, uh, they're the large, they appear to be the largest voting group. And a lot of that had to do with, I'm going to be honest with you, Mayor Carpenter was quite effective in pulling out the Cape Verdean vote. But yeah. really, it is actually the African Americans and the Latin voters. Okay. They are so the silent majority in Brockton. People don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But when you look at, when you look, I'm going to tell you, there's some powerful people. When you look like a Mike Curry that lives in Brockton, people don't realize it. Powerful Black individuals live in former heads of the NAACP, people that are judges live in Brockton. It's just that we, just like me, just like me, I'm raised in Roxburgh. We just like our political philosophy and being reared in this has been Boston, but we're very, very influential. It's just that it's just not recognized. So I hear, I hear what you're saying. So, but so I, let me just make my point. If you look at that community specifically, yeah. um, as far as being progressive or conservative, I'd say they're more conservative than they are. progressive. They are. So I would say that if you're looking at Brockton, yes, to your question, there is room for that. Um, but how do you pull that out? I don't know. How do you, because I don't know. I, And then people vote because of name. They vote because of, um, you know, if there's a popular person in the K Verdean community and they're more conservative, they don't care if that they're conservative. Let me not say they, they don't care, but oftentimes the people that are voting are not distinguishing between whether they're more, this background noise, sorry, more that, progressive yeah. or more conservative. It's just that they're K Verdean. Do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So no, it, it, yeah, it, it's it it makes a whole lot of sense. And is that a problem though for the city? Is that a problem in sense that we're voting? And so this, as people who don't know, um, I do a lot of diversity and inclusive training. And one of the things that we've been talking about in recent years is what we call a black ethnicity. That is that you you're, you may be a Cape Verdean, you may be a Jamaican American, but you don't necessarily want to connect to the term African American. Uh, and so in saying that, we all seem to have the same social issues. So why would someone, because we're, we're approaching this, why would somebody want to vote based upon ethnicity instead of just saying that, you know, I, I believe in police reform. I believe in lower property taxes. I believe in the best schools. Can someone vote for a Tony Branch? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just asking. I mean... You know, I mean, then again, with my locks, I kind of look over. I mean, but can you know, can somebody vote for outside of my last name being Lopes or Cardoso or Mendez? Go ahead, you come on, y'all. People don't. Then nobody's listening to this. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but Rita, what um, you, okay, Rita, what are you thinking? How do we get people not to vote ethnicity? That's the question. Right, and that that is a, a very hard question because. I don't think people necessarily uh, voting on issues, just like what right. you mentioned. And, and, and that would make sense for you to look at the what you care, what you want it to be changed, and then vote accordingly. But that's not how we see it. We see it uh, based on who is more connected to them. So if I can speak their language, if I go to their parties, if I if they know me on a personal level, they, they know that I will be there advocating for what they believe in. So it, it's very hard um, to really address that. And, and I know it, it's not rational, but it's just how human beings are. They, they're just socially attached to whoever they know they'll feel comfortable with that person. So um, yeah, Tina, well, you so, might as well just jump in, but I, I do think that that is a, a concern. People don't necessarily vote for the things that they're concerned about. They vote on those who they feel they can best approach and talk to and they'll understand 
it's probably not rational, but unfortunately that is how we see it uh, in, in the voting places. Every time when there's election, that's what we see happening. So let me just say this too. I was in a, uh, a, a meeting. No, no, I w it was a campaign meeting. I was. And someone in that campaign was talking to a group of people that don't look like me. Uh, he was very loud. I'm going to say he was a he. And he said, if the African-Americans and the Haitians and the Cape Verdeans got together, they would run our city. He's right. Uh, so I guess my question is, when I hear powerful white men talking like that, uh, and everybody knows I'm credible, because I look right in the camera, I'm credible. Uh, I'm not going to drop his name. But when I hear powerful white men that talk like that, I guess I'm wondering, you two are powerful women of color elected to office. I don't have to talk about holding you two accountable for anything right now, but how are you How are you two leading a next generation? What is your personal com commitment or example of people that you are taking a hand and pulling along? I'm so, uh, <laughs> so, um for me, like I've always said that, the, again, this seat wasn't just going to be mine and that I was going to pull other people in. It's very difficult in our community because we have a large community of large immigrant community and we also have non-English speaking folks and folks who don't have access to information. They don't know how to get the information. They don't know how to stay involved and to stay engaged. And even if they wanted to run for office, they don't know who to reach out to. You know what I mean? Um, and we don't know, we don't have an ability to access a lot of folks. I mean, social media is fine, but it's not, not everyone's on social media. So how do you find them? How do you outreach to them so that you can pull them in? How do you make this job has been so hard for me. Mm -hmm. um, how, when people are watching me they're like, Lord, I don't want to do that. Tina looks stressed out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do you make it so that it's like, okay, this is okay. Um, we can do this together. I mean, reach out to me and I can, you know, help guide you. If you want to run for office, I'm here for you. There's a lot of challenges in this community around that. And I think it's just because of access. We just don't have good access to each other. I have some friends on Facebook that follow me, but not all, you know, I can do some things on a radio and, in, in, you know, and share information that way. I can do a little bit on, you know, different platforms, but it's just not enough. This, this, there's such a disconnect within the community and it's such a, we have such a hard time reaching people that I just don't know how, you know, how are we going to be able, I, I just, I don't know. I really don't know the answer. I don't know how we're going to be able to reach people that really want to run for office and keep them engaged because there's like different pockets of folks and people work in silos and it's just so hard to bring people together in this community. Rita? Yes, and thank you for asking that question. Uh, Councilor Cardoza and myself, we were having that conversation with Phyllis Ellis and then we were talking about that. How can we get more people involved to run for office, maybe uh, holding a seminar, training people, getting them engaged, see who, who really wants to. And then know what for us, the question that she asked us, how much do you guys get paid? I'm like, oh yeah, speaking of that, we don't really get, it's like a stipend. And she's like, it's very, she was like, great, can't get my black community people getting involved. How am I gonna encourage them? Because they have real jobs. They work two, three times, three part-time jobs. They are single parents. They have their kids. They don't really have that availability to be doing this extra because they're saying it's part-time, but it's not part-time because you're 24 seven. Once they call you, you need to make sure that you're there for them because they may be, may be calling you during times of crisis. So you need to make sure that you are available, make yourself available. So that is something too, like we, what we get paid is just a stipend. It's nothing that really gives that incentive to the, but, and she was very honest and straightforward. She was like, 
I don't know how I can sell that to people. And she's right, because that's just the reality. So this is very hard because we don't really, we're not, you know, swimming in money. We don't get paid a whole lot of money. So it's very hard to get people who look at like us, who speak like us, who really is that engaged to make that sacrifice and say, you know, I want to run for office. I will be given my time, volunteering my time for my city, for the love of my city, because I really think it's that important. It's very hard to convince people, especially when what we pay is not that enticing. So that's the sad reality. So what do you think in, in terms of, and uh, Courtney gave me a, a very, very good question. It's something that I've been thinking about uh, since she sent me the email. So what is the future of activism then? What really, I mean, do, okay, so, Tony Branch, I'm on the Cape Verdean board. Okay. I'm on the Cape, I'm on the Haitian community. I'm on the NAACP. I'm elected to a school committee. But what is the future of activism so things can actually get done? So, and I, I'm not trying to please people do not um, think that I'm picking on Brockton, but Brockton is my lens right now. So when I look at people, no matter where you stand on cannabis, hundreds of thousands of African-American men and Latinx are in jail over marijuana, no matter where you stand on it morally. So when I look at what happened in terms of the cannabis licensing over the last four years in Brockton, people like, we can't even make money legitimately. What is the future of activism on issues that give us generational wealth? Uh, so we had to have a pandemic for people to figure out that the healthcare system has been failing black people Really, are you are, you, are we serious about this now? We had to have a pandemic for people to realize, oh yeah, you know, uh, you yeah, know, they get cancer at a higher rate, they get prostate problems, and no, we're not going to do anything about it because a lot of the science was based upon guess what, racism. Uh, so, what is the future of activism? I, I'll get off my, get off my, <laughs> you know. You really want to get me going tonight? You don't I mention don't that. Don't mention marijuana, please. <laughs> I uh, hear he's a, he's a calmer, but I will. I oh, my God. <laughs> I'm still hopeful that that will be one of our wins that we can celebrate in Brockton. So I will continue to fight until that's one of our wins. Uh, we have deliveries coming up that we need to tackle that um, black folks can compete. It's a, it's an area of the industry that people of color can possibly compete because it might be less startup costs for them. So there's still work to be done around that. So I, I still remain hopeful. There, there are a lot of people that are working hard uh, around this issue. And I hope to continue to learn because this was all new for me. As a nurse, I um, have counseled a lot of my patients for not smoking marijuana because it was bad for their health. So, um, but anything that provides economic empowerment to the black community, I'm all for it. Okay. What does activism look like, though, in the future? What does so, it look like on, on bread? And what I love to hear. First of all, we know that Tip O'Neill said all politics is local. Secondly, what does activism look like in the lens of, and I'm, I'm being respectful, in the lens of Tina, you and Rita have been pushing, pushing, pushing for things. Honestly, the needle's not moving towards, the needle's not moving in the right direction. With all due respect, the needle really isn't moving in the right Well, way. you know, Tony, you got to go backwards before you can move forward. I remember when Trump took office, that's that I I was I felt the same way I feel now. I said this is going to be hell for 4 years, but then there's going to be a movement, okay? And so we in Brockton, we are so behind the times with 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 all of this. So it's going to it's going to take time. And again to Rita's point about the salary for city council is not attractive for people of color because we go into Boston to work cuz we need to make money. We're in single parent households that we need. my I raised my kids in Brockton as a single mom. I had to go to BMC cuz that's where they paid. I wasn't making any money at Good Sam. I couldn't afford my rent. Right. So I had to go into Boston. So a lot of folks in Brockton, especially people of color that are in those situations, they go and seek the money elsewhere because the salaries just are not there. And so it's going to take time for us to ha get people more interested in politics and more representation on the council and, you know, and more, um, get people more engaged and involved. I said, I say that we just continue to do what we're doing. Okay. We keep 
trying to affect change as best we can. We celebrate the little wins that we get. And then we just keep, we just keep at it. We just can't give up. Rita? Yes, and uh, Tony, you gave a perfect example. You've listed all of the things that you involved in in the city. The question here is, how do you make disciples? How do you have other people following you to make sure that when you're no longer here, your work is continuing on? And that's the same question I asked to myself and to Tina and to all of us who wants to see that change. How can we not just ourselves, like you're saying, we're pushing the needle and nothing seems to be happening because we're still trying to do this alone. But when we're making disciples, when we're training people, when we're getting them engaged and involved, that's when change will start happening. And I think that is where the lack is because of that apathy, because people are just losing hope because just the same questions you asked, they're not really that engaged. They don't really want to go out and vote. They don't think their vote really matters. They don't think there's really much of a change. But while we're still thinking like that and then we're not making our own disciples to go on the work that we're beginning, then we can go backwards. We can try to see the future, but it's going to stop once we're gone and we have to keep on and building on to that future. So I think that is the only way that activism can grow and make a difference. Councilor Mendez, are you running for re-election? Yes, <laughs> very excited to. Tina Cardoso, are you running for re-election? Not sure. <laughs> well, well, I'm asking this for a reason. Uh, so, so, so my work right now is to continue to empower the community, to continue to get people involved, to continue to hopefully empower other women and people of color to run for office. That's the work that I want to do. And I got to be really honest, sometimes in doing that work and the way that you present yourself, mm. you, you scare people away from you. Okay. But I just, I have to find, I, I'm not going to, you know, if I have to jeopardize my seat, but I can get somebody else in there, the work continues. Oh, Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So that's that. That's oh. what's important to me is the work continues by empowering. If I just sit there and I conform to the way that it is, we get nothing done just so I can keep a seat. I'm not interested in just keeping a seat. I'm interested in empowering my community. And so I will continue to do that work and then I will consider reelection when the time is right. So let me, I don't know how much time I have, but so I'm gonna, so I'm gonna fast forward. Mayor Sullivan announces, if, if he announces that he's running for re-election, most likely he will. Um, in terms of holding people accountable, are you all willing to go out on a limb to criticize this mayor? Absolutely, I think you have to. You know, you, you don't get a, this was a tough year. You know, the pandemic, it, you know, it's hard your first year in office. You can't really get much done. And then you you top that off with the pandemic. It was even harder, you know, for him to get anything done. But I think you have to criticize. You can't just give people a pass. You have to criticize what they, you highlight what they've done good, but then you have to criticize what hasn't gone so good. And that's how you affect change. If we just say, oh, Mayor, everything you're, you've done has been fabulous. He doesn't know if he's doing something wrong. So we have to, you know, make sure that we're staying on top of it. We're holding him accountable. We're holding all of the city councilors, the school committee, everybody accountable, and that we're showing them the things that we think that could go better. Council, Councilor Mendez, there's no secret, you, no secret that you've held this mayor accountable. Um, do you regret it? No, because um, I think that all women, all people of color, we should speak up for what we believe is right. And uh, the moment that we keep on carrying that burden inside of us, it just kills us. And, and we're in there because we all just want to hold each other accountable. So yes, I will be holding the mayor accountable, just like as we were going to be holding other city councilors accountable as well, because I, I am not running for mayor, so I have no interest in, in really... Uh, it, that would be if someone else is running against him or, or something like that. But I think we should, despite of any of that, we should really hold each other as accountable. And that is how we grow. That's how we pass forward. And that's how we keep uh, working towards the embedment of the city of Brockton. That, that is how 
we uh, do what is best for the city, for the people. And, and that's the only way, just by holding each other accountable. Is if I do something wrong as well, please do hold me accountable because this is a power that we have been holding this seat and we have to be held accountable. So uh, call us, uh, ask questions, be involved. If we take a vote that maybe you don't agree, call and ask the question, what was the rationale? Why did you take that position? You may not agree with me, but at least you understand where I was coming from. And then we can all respect each other. And that's all we can ask for. So let me just, so uh, coming out from, or coming after the murder of George Floyd, it is now, we're now going on into February of 2021. The Brockton City Council, unlike other town councils and city council across the Commonwealth, took no position in terms of a resolution um, after the death of George Floyd. Can you tell the constituents why was it, do you think you just can't get your colleagues to weigh in? Or will you get, you know, uh, you know, low marks for not participating with the police? Why did this city council not make a formal statement around the murder of George Floyd? You just want to get me all types of upset tonight. <laughs> you guys know I was going to ask hard questions. <laughs> I, I So you know that I was instrumental in creating the health equity task force um, that the mayor put in place. And I sat on that task force for many months advocating around um, different racial equities that existed in the city during the pandemic and how to allocate resources and where to allocate resources. One of the things that came out of our task force was a pledge and it was a Brockton city pledge that I submitted to the city for them to adopt after the George Floyd murders and the Black Lives Matter protests. Never happened. Don't ask me why it didn't happen. I don't know why it didn't happen, but that was like one of the very first things that we, we talked about is that we need a statement. And so that didn't happen. Um, there were many recommendations made to the city. Some things, you know, they followed up on, some things they didn't. I, I have since left the task force because I just felt like I needed to for my own for my own health and well-being. But I don't know, Tony. I I did my due diligence to try to get that submitted into the meet, uh, the mayor. We worked hard and we never saw it. So so you so uh, so uh, so Tina, just so Rita, I need you to respond to this as well. But so do you guys really understand that for all of us as people of color and for those that are watching, you see a murder, you see a murder on video. You live in a city that is predominantly men and women of color and the council cannot come up with some sort of a statement. And I'm gonna be respectful in saying this. If you morally can't do it, why wasn't it done politically? Rita, what say you? Why, why no statement on the George Floyd murder? Yeah, we. Th there's no right answer to give you here because that would be make an excuse. And I don't think there is an excuse to, to even give. And that goes back to what I said before. Yes, that happened over there to George Floyd, but that doesn't happen here in Brockton. We're not, so maybe that's the mentality, not making up for excuses, but maybe that wasn't the priority. And, and it's just not how people in the city, they'll, they'll, they view that because they feel that they're not being uh, recognized or acknowledged or even empathized. So it just really makes the city of Brockton look bad. And I'm not here um, really coming up with an excuse or, or proper politically good answer to give you because unfortunately there isn't any. There, there, there's just, it's, it's shameful, it's sad. We talked about doing the pledge. We talked about trying to make something to at least acknowledge we know that this is a problem and we want to address it that in the city of Brockton, we are going to be holding each other accountable to make sure this never happens in Brockton. We're all treated equally. And we had all lined up and, and just never came to- That should have been the very first thing that happened exactly. and it didn't. Right. And so again, it goes back, Tony, to people checking themselves. I'll say that over and over again. How do you really feel about this? It's one thing to put it in writing, which happens a lot, but it's another thing to really understand it and subscribe to it. And I think that that's the work that needs to be done. 
You know, it's not just, oh, I'm going to put this up on a website that we believe in diversity and inclusion and we condone this and that. You really have to put the, you know, the um, legwork and, you know, the, you the, the, right. Right. yeah, behind it. So, Courtney, um, how much time do we have? Yeah, I actually just, um, we're going to actually start wrapping up. This was a great dialogue. I really enjoyed it. I always get excited over this. This is, this is the area of my expertise here. And there's been quite a qu few questions that Tony asked that I just wanted to jump in and, and have my own little two cents. Um, we're going to take some questions from the chat box. Um, so I'll give you guys a few moments to, you know, type out your questions. Um, and in the meantime, I, I know Tony touched on, you know, are there room for black conservatives? And I do want to touch on that because I actually, I did my paper on that. Um, we do need to create an open space for black conservatives uh, or the, at least the blue dog Democrats because there's not a, a place for us. And I know that I've, I've had a lot of conversations with people. I own my own political consulting firm. I actually just started it recently, but I've worked with a lot of candidates and they say, you know what? I, I'm confined to two parties, but I don't necessarily agree with every, each, you know, each side. And I'm one that I don't agree with both sides, but I do lean more towards the conservative side. And I find that very difficult uh, especially as a woman of color, a lot of people think that the black or brown community are monolithic and that is not true. We have to get out, outside of that, that mindset. Um, and I, I'd read a book and I want to share with you guys. And of course we can send it in an email. Um, it's called the profiles of a new black Vanguard. It's an old, but I read it in undergrad and it was very good. It talked about the black conservatives and how they won uh, in a community that kind of frowned upon their, their conservative views. Um, I know Tina, you've mentioned on uh, trying to get people civically engaged. That's my area. We can always connect and uh, find ways that we can get more women of color in office. That's exactly why I started my firm. It's not exclusively to uh, black women, but I, I had the mindset that that's who I wanted, I wanted to work with. Um, I see Gary, Gary Keith. Hi, I actually remember you. He just put something, not a question, but um, he wanted to say that the, that there are a lot of people out of touch. He's a conservative and um, he's tried to run for office four times, but he didn't get the complete backing of the Democratic Party. Yep, Gary, I understand. Um, and, and I think like, uh, Tony can correct me if I'm wrong, but they don't really back local um, folks that are running for office. Is that correct? Well, they well, don't endorse. Well, the, the, the problem with, the problem with Brockton, unlike what we, we finally transitioned Boston, is, I mean, you have a Mam Leo, so you have the minority law enforcement organization that uh, who are police officers, similar to any other police union that can endorse black candidates and make a pun. You have the Falcons as well, which is the, or the Vol Falcons of the Vulcans, uh, the firemen's organization. The, the issue with Brockton is that, you know, they they the unions back people that look like them. And that when you try to have this, open dialogue conversation that that particular person may not be the, the best candidate for the black community, um, you get shunned and you get criticized. And then they make this argument, well, what are you talking about, Bishop? It's, it's, it's nonpartisan. It's not not really nonpartisan, come on. Uh, to, to Courtney's point, can a, a blue dog Democrat run in Brockton and get, le be, uh, get elected? In Plymouth County, yes because Plymouth County is predominantly Republican and conservative, that sort of Democrat can win if they were out, to, if they went full-fledged and was open and honest with the voters. Uh, but in Brockton, you have this issue with um, people wanting to remain in control of the, the, can I say it? Municipal jobs and appointments. Oops. <laughs> I'm so, I know I'm in trouble, so I, hey, I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say that um, I'm not here to, to, to diss Brockton. I love Brockton. We Brockton both, afforded yeah. me many opportunities for my kids to raise three beautiful girls who all did really well in Brockton and went to Brockton High School. Um, I just want us to recognize that we do have issues and I want us to figure out a way that we can come together to work on them. But when you keep meeting resistance over and over and over and over again, and people keep saying, oh, this is how we've always done it. Oh, no, that's not true. We're just doing this. Minute. And then when you watch, I sat on the zoning board. I watch white people come in and protest stuff. It, you know, it was like, whoa. But then I saw Black people come in and struggle to get their projects um, passed. You know, and so when you 
witnessed this over and over again and people are not hearing you, that something needs to be done and it starts with you. Um, it's just frustrating. It's frustrating. But, uh, but this, this, this webinar was really about accountability and what's scaring me, I'm really, an, uh, I'm scared, or I shouldn't say maybe nervous, what's making me nervous is that like, what I'm kind of hearing is, read a way in on this, folks can't be held accountable. Rita, anybody? I mean, because I'm hearing all this negative, uh, the struggles that Tina has had, the struggle <laughs> that Rita has had, um, Courtney in terms of blue dog Democrats and conservatives. So how, are, how are we gonna so, hold people accountable? So how do you hold them accountable in Brockton Bishop? You got the answer to that? <laughs> so you have, oh, you have some I folks do. that, you have folks that are disconnected Yes. Okay. And then you have a large minority community. You have folks that don't speak English. You have uh, two cultures that kind of at times don't see eye to eye. Um, and how do you do that? How do you unite people so that with accountability, you have to have, let's say, you got to have the, the, the power. Let's just use that word um, to do so. You have to have money. You have to have power at times. Um, and you have to have strong leadership. You have to have strong leadership. How do you do that? How do you do that in Brockton? Let me ask you a question. <laughs> so it goes back to how all of us are staying connected to the constituents. So I do that by staying on board. But I, but my political science says this. To, so what I've seen in the last decade in Brockton. So the Brockton Enterprise, the local newspaper, uh, I don't think has had maybe never but they can criticize me if they want. So now they're working on doing it, but they haven't had a black reporter. Are you aware of that? Are you guys aware of that? So I think that's the, we don't have news media covering our issues in the city of Brockton. So the masses of the people that look at the enterprise can see what's going on other than car crashes and them plastering all those K Verdean faces that have been arrested. And I'm saying it because it's true. If yes. I'm wrong, prove me wrong. Look at the enterprise and everything you see plastered is all our Black brothers in Cape Verdean when they were arrested. And this has been going on for an awful long time. So that sends the message that they're up to it again. You know, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad. So we know that the messaging is out there. So my, my point is that we need to stay connected. And how do we get there? Um, with this limited amount of media? Is it just boards? Is it just the NAACP? The boards are not enough. They're not right. enough. So how, how are we going to do this? I don't Courtney, know. Maybe Courtney, maybe Courtney can help us. We'll think, on it. we'll think on it. So it doesn't look like there were any questions that came in. So I guess we, we talked so much that uh, they got all their answers. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. This is, we're right on time to, uh, to go ahead and start wrapping up. I want to thank you guys. I always love with you all. I know I've, I've been to plenty of events where I've met with you all and the NAACP and a, a lot of other events. I hope that, you know, when this pandemic is over, we can all, you know, reconvene and have these healthy conversations in the future. I want to thank you personally. And I want to thank you as a representative of the South Shore chapter of Sigma Gamma Rose Sorority. This was a great way to end off our last webinar in the voter education series. And I want to thank the participants um, that are that had listened in on everything. I we love you and we are so happy that we had your continued support. Um, I don't know if you guys have any closing words, but uh, if not, I will go ahead and and let you guys have the rest of your evening. Thank you so much, Courtney. This was awesome. And thank you to Bishop Tony Branch, who always makes the conversation interesting. And thank you for everyone that participated. I hope you stay involved, stay engaged, get out and vote. Um, and folks can reach out to me anytime if they have questions, concerns, I'm always willing to help. Thank you so much. It was great being part of this uh, event. I didn't know it was going to be this fun, but I actually enjoyed it. And I hope that all those that were listening really got a lot out of this. And if you didn't get anything more, just I hope that you get this message to, to do get involved, to stay involved, don't have the apathy, and don't leave us alone, we need you. So mm -hmm. stay with us so that to help us, you know, move things forward. Thank you. I want to thank Vice President Courtney Henderson for this great evening. I want to thank Sigma Gamma Rho for sponsoring this, the, the South Shore Alumni Chapter. And I just want to tell you all not to forget 150,000 years ago, our DNA proved this, one single African woman 
made us all. So stay black and stay proud. Good evening to you. All right. Good night.